Welcome back to my series, Roaming the Sierra Nevada Foothills and Her Watersheds. Today's topic is rice. California is the second largest grower of rice in the United States. Rice is Placer County's leading agricultural crop. In California, rice is a $5 billion industry, creating thousands of local jobs. We produce the finest quality of rice in the world. Rice is not native to the United States. We followed the history of rice from its introduction into colonial South Carolina to its introduction into Northern California. Until the early 20th century, California was a major importer of rice. Today, we are an exporter of rice. How this turn of events came about is the core theme of our story. We first need a few backstories. Our first stop takes us to the small agricultural town of Biggs. The town is located 62 miles north of Sacramento, off of Highway 99. The city's welcome sign says it all. The heart of the rice country. Biggs and her smaller neighboring town of Richvale will play an important role later in our story. The 19th century was the age of rails. A new railroad line, the Oregon-California Railroad, ran from Oregon through Biggs and Richvale, ending in San Francisco. Because of massive corruption, the line failed. Central Pacific Railroad took custody and then turned the line over to their subsidiary, Southern Pacific Railroad. Central Pacific's Railroad's business plan would have Southern Pacific handle the sale of Central Pacific's vast land holdings. In the late 1800s, Southern Pacific Railroad reached all the way to Louisiana. Our rural Butte County towns of Biggs and Richvale would be connected to the then rice capitals of the United States, Texas and Louisiana. But we are getting far ahead of our tale. Our next task is to define botanically what is rice and what is not rice. The rice plant is a semi-aquatic grass. Rice can be divided into three different families. Many are familiar with American Indian wild rice. Our indigenous tribes living around the Great Lakes region harvested this grain for thousands of years. From a genetic point of view, Indian wild rice is not rice. However, there are two distant cousins of American Indian wild rice that are classified as rice, Asian rice and African rice. While both are semi-aquatic grasses, African rice is grown mostly in West Africa's Niger River Delta. It is less popular than Asian rice. Our story will center on Asian rice. Domestication of Asian rice may have gone back 13,000 years. To complicate our story, Asian rice can be broken down into 120,000 different genetic differences. You're not going to make us listen to 120,000 variations? Too complicated? Let's simplify. We can divide Asian rice into three different rice bowls, short grain, known as Japanese sticky rice, which is great for sushi or for making sake. Less sticky is medium grain, great for risotto. In our third bowl, Chinese long grain, which is light and fluffy and even less sticky. Long grain can also be aromatic. A favorite in Thailand is jasmine rice. The three varieties have different growing requirements. This fact will determine which variety can be grown in California. In all parts of Asia, whether your faith was Hindu, Buddhist, or Shinto, rice was more than a food. It was spiritual. Since rice was not native to the Americas, European settlers would introduce rice to both North and South America. Our story picks up in South Carolina. Many of the colony's first settlers arrived from the British-held Caribbean islands. The Caribbean settlers wanted to replicate the Caribbean plantation system, master and slaves. The geology of Carolina's lowlands created a problem. What do you do with marshlands? Rice. There is profit in growing rice. Rice is eaten by the people living throughout the Mediterranean basin, as well as it is eaten by the enslaved in the Caribbean, and forget not the slaves here in the English colonies. In the mother country, there is growing appetite for rice. 
But kind sir, we doth not knoweth how to grow a thrice. They knoweth in Madagascar, Africa. Slavers were sent to Madagascar to procure those who knew how to grow rice. Kidnapped and chained, along with their knowledge of rice agriculture, they were shipped as cargo and sold to the Carolina plantations. Once they were free, but now they were slaves in Carolina. Their first task was to show their owners how to carve out rice patties. The patties had to be level and shallow, maybe just five inches deep. Planting rice seed was far different than casting seed for wheat. The rice plants were germinated away from the paddy. Later, the seedlings were individually transferred and planted it into the flooded paddy. In the fall, the dried rice straw would be harvested. Using the ancient practice of winnowing, the rice was separated from the straw. The harvested rice, called rice paddy, was not edible as the rice was encased in a husk. To remove the husk, a pestle and mortar was used. This task was reserved for the enslaved women, as they were skilled in not breaking the rice into pieces. Broken rice was not as valuable. Freed from the husks, the color of rice was brown. Further milling removed more of the bran layers, revealing white rice. As rice production boomed, to remove the husks, Rice mills were established. The pestles and mortars grew in size, but now were operated by steam power, tidal surges, or water wheels. The growing success required an ever-growing need for more slaves. Between 1750 and 1725, it has been estimated that 50,000 Africans from the rice-growing regions of Africa were kidnapped and shipped to Carolina. It did not matter to the plantation masters that malaria, yellow fever, and the unsanitary rice patties decimated the slave population. What mattered was that rice, known as Carolina gold, was a profitable export. The tragedy that began on April 12, 1861 in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina would mark the beginning of the end of South Carolina's rice plantations. Lincoln's emancipation of the slaves, followed by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, ended slavery. Few former slaves would return to the rice paddies. The final blow came when two hurricanes pummeled South Carolina's coastline. The Carolina rice infrastructure was destroyed. As the rice industry in South Carolina declined, a new rice center began to blossom. In the 1880s, the nascent Louisiana and Texas coastal rice farming belt began to expand. When they learned that rice farming could be more profitable than grain farming, Midwestern farmers began migrating south. In support of the rice industry, farm equipment manufacturers began making equipment specifically designed for the rice industry. In the spring of 1909, Louisiana State University opened a rice research station. Its purpose was to develop new rice varieties as well as to learn better rice farming practices. The station today covers 1,000 acres. Okay, is everyone ready? Yes, I hear someone whistling. It is time we pick up our story in Northern California. Meet me at the Houston Train Depot, where we will catch this SP train to San Francisco. As the poster boasts, in California there is a climate for health and wealth, room for a million immigrants, not to mention 43,795,000 acres of government land waiting to be taken. For all my AI audience, I've reserved first class seats on the SP Sunset route. Meet me at the Houston train station. Since we arrived a little early, I have just one more tale to tell. A little side trip to Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's just a short tale, but as you will see, most important. In 1885, 
slavery was still legal in Brazil. Meet Evaristo Conrado Engelberg, an engineer by training. The story begins with Evaristo watching a slave using the laborious traditional method to gin patty rice into brown rice. In his mind, he thought, there must be a more efficient way to mill rice. He picked up some patty rice and rubbed the seed between his fingers. He rubbed the patty rice until husk came off. He thought, what if we poured the rice in between two rotating abrasive drums? Could that safely remove the husk? His idea worked perfectly. His new gin revolutionized both coffee and rice milling. He took out patents and began manufacturing his gin in New York. Using his invention, larger rice milling plants came online. Rice farming became more efficient. I hear the train whistle. All aboard! We head west on Southern Pacific Sunset Line Express train direct to San Francisco. Let's sum up. After the Civil War, Texas and Louisiana became a prosperous rice growing region. With both the rail lines and seaports, Texas and Louisiana exported rice. In addition, their farmers had access to the latest rice farm equipment. Louisiana State University developed the first rice research center. Southern Pacific Railroad helped disseminate LSU's research by visiting farm communities with their demonstration train. As we shall see, California was not so lucky. Her wheat farmers, as well as her cattle ranches, were in rapid decline. At this period in history, California was importing rice. How this all changed will be in the second half of our story. First, we need to review a little bit about California's early history to understand her future. In 1566, Spain conquered and then colonized the Philippines. Three-way trade developed between Asia, the Philippines, and Mexico. From their port in Acapulco, Mexico, the Spanish shipped to Manila silver bullion, cocoa, pineapples, tomatoes, peanuts, and corn, in return, Manila exported Chinese porcelain, silk, Asian spices, and Asian long grain rice. The imported Asian rice became a favorite food in the Spanish American colonies. Spain's hold on Alta California was precarious. She claimed Alta California by right of discovery, but had no presence to secure her claim. Russia began colonizing the Aleutian Islands and moving south down into Alaska. Soon England and America would follow. The new gold was fur. From Lincoln's beaver hat to women's fashion, if it moved and it had fur, there were buyers in China, Europe, and the United States. Fashion demands fur, lots of fur. In 1812, Russia established a fort in Alta, California, Fort Ross. Spanish King Charles III, a defender of Spanish territories, recognized that Alta California was at risk. He authorized an expedition to secure Spain's control over Alta California. Franciscan priest Junipero Serra and military officer Gaspar Portola were placed in charge of the expedition. They planned initially to establish two missions and two presidios. The first presidio, would be in San Diego, and the second presidio would be established in a bay where years earlier Vizcaino had named the bay Monterey. Sarah and Portola hiked or rode a horse from Baja California to San Diego. They were accompanied by 28 soldiers and a group of Baja California Indians and muleteers. Their first stop was San Diego. While Father Serra remained in San Diego, Portola and his party continued on to Monterey, arriving in Monterey on September 30th, 1769. Portola was confused as to whether the bay they found was the bay described by Vizcaino. Not sure, he and his party continued marching north. On November 2nd, 1769, Portola climbed a hill to get a perspective as to where he was. What he saw was a sight that even the English captain, Sir Francis Drake, had passed in the fog. Wonder of wonders, 
he became the first European to view San Francisco Bay. Over the next 54 years, Spain would construct 21 missions and four presidios, all connected by a rough road 600 miles in length. In September of 1821, Mexico threw off the Spanish yoke and won her independence. Mexico closed all 21 missions, requested that half the mission lands be transferred to California's first people, as well as outlawing slavery. Mexico now faced the same problem that Spain had faced, how to stop settlers entering her territory illegally. To buttress her territory, Mexico granted large rancheros to those who promised to protect Mexico from illegal immigration. Each black dot on this map was a granted ranchero, either from Spain or Mexico. Cattle hides and tallow became California's prime agricultural export. If you ever visit Northern California, the Sutter name is found everywhere. German-born Johann Augustus Sutter was a man running from the law. In Switzerland, he had married a wealthy widow's daughter. After he ran up massive debt, he faced debtor's prison. To avoid jail, Sutter abandoned his wife and five children and left Europe for America. Okay, can the Swiss music. We need to get to America. In America, he claimed he had been a captain in the Swiss Army, which has been unproven. However, he renamed himself Captain John Sutter. He bounced around the United States, even visiting the Russian Alaskan town of Sitka. Hearing of possible wealth to be made in the Mexican province of Alta California, Sutter caught a ship heading for Monterey. In Monterey, he convinced the governor of Alta California, Juan Batista Alvarado, that if Alvarado granted Sutter a ranchero, with Sutter's military background, Sutter would protect Mexico from illegal immigration. Oh, and he changed his name to Don Juan Sutter. Sutter received a ranchero covering 48,800 acres and never did anything to fulfill his bargain with the governor. Um, excuse me, Mike. Actually, did you know that Sutter was a very bad man? He enslaved the local Indians, participated in murder, and even took advantage of them. All too true. Diseases spread by Europeans, enslavement, expulsion, and even murder dropped their population from as high as possibly 700,000 to 50,000 by 1860. So what does Sutter have to do with rice? It was Sutter's lumber mill in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains that gold was discovered. Rice was not popular food here in Alta California, but the 1849 gold rush would change everything. Over a Texas land dispute, the United States and Mexico went to war. The peace treaty awarded Alta California to the United States, and we paid Mexico $15 million to close the deal. From the four corners of the globe, news of the California gold strike brought thousands to California. The population almost instantly jumped from 8,000 to 100,000 in one year. By 1860, California's population rose to 380,000. Okay, I'm gonna need a little drum roll because this is the point where we find out why California became a net importer of rice and how California became a leading exporter of rice. The story begins not here in California, but in Southern China. Years of warfare between the British, as well as China's own civil wars, had left southern China destitute. Knowledge that there was a mountain of gold was too good to pass up. Families, as well as villages, pooled their resources and sent their sons and fathers on a desperate chance that they could save their villages or families from poverty. They embarked on a perilous voyage to find a place called Gold Mountain. It was estimated that 30% of California's placer gold miners were from China. Chinatowns began to spring up. The construction of the Transcontinental Railroad employed 15,000 Chinese workers. By contract, the Central Pacific Railroad had to supply its workers with rice. 
whether the Chinese immigrants fished, worked on the railroad, mined for gold, or worked in agriculture, Chinese immigrants still made rice a central part of their diet. Since California did not grow rice, to sustain the Chinese community, how much rice did California need to import? In 1850, the United States Census estimated that California's population was 92,597. California felt that number was an undercount. Within 20 years, the population jumped to 560,247. The census showed that 9% of California's population was of Chinese heritage. That would be 48,790. We now need to do a little figuring. A University of California at Davis professor estimated that an average Chinese worker consumed one pound of rice per day. So one pound times 48,790 Chinese residents times 365 days per year equals 17,808,350 pounds of rice. All would have to be imported into California. All shipments of rice had to be imported, mostly from China. The Civil War blocked shipments from South Carolina or other southern states. California legislature recognized the need to develop rice farming in California. October 26, 1862, the Daily Alta newspaper reported the cultivation of rice. The law passed by the last legislature for the encouragement of agriculture and manufacturers in California offers for the first thousand pounds of rice a reward of $250, for the first five thousand pounds $500, and for the first ten thousand pounds $1,000. In 1870, the offer was rescinded as there were no successful rice crops produced. 1852. Commodity Trading for Rice Does anyone know who Emperor Norton was? I know. He runs a bar in San Francisco. Not even close. Most people remember him as a penniless vagrant wandering the streets of San Francisco. He would tell anyone who would listen he was Emperor of the United States. He even handed out currency with his name etched across the bills. Few today know of his background. His English parents, with their child Joshua Norton in tow, moved to Cape Town, South Africa. Dad was involved in maritime trade. Upon his parents' death, with $40,000 in inheritance, now worth $1 million, he headed to San Francisco seeking his fortune in the 1849 California Gold Rush. Norton quickly became involved in buying and selling commodities. He established his office on the corner of Jackson and Sampson Street. Being an importer of rice, he used the power of a mule and constructed a rice mill in front of his office. The price of rice in California depended upon world events. In 1852, civil war erupted in China. Within China, the war created widespread famine. China, a major exporter of rice, curtailed rice shipments. As a result, the price of rice rose. In December of 1852, Norton heard that a large shipment of rice would be arriving from Peru. Norton bought the entire shipment. He paid $20,000 in cash. His quick math showed that he would flip the Peruvian rice, earning a hefty return of $72,000. You know the old saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Unknown to Norton, there were two other Peruvian rice ships heading into San Francisco Harbor. The price of rice suddenly dropped below what Norton paid. What was sure profit was now a total loss. Eventually, through other miscalculations, Norton's company collapsed into bankruptcy. Now self-proclaimed emperor was left penniless wandering the streets of San Francisco. Beginning in 1862 through the 1880s, tremendous changes in California's weather patterns occurred. In one season, there would be torrential rains, followed by the next season of blistering sun and drought. 
it was estimated 200,000 steers died from either drowning or died of thirst. Their carcasses littered the floor of the Central Valley. The age of hides and tallow came to an end. The new gold of California agriculture would be wheat. California's ranch owners were short on laborers. Using the latest labor-saving technologies was an imperative. Holt Manufacturing Company came to the rescue, having developed innovative harvesters. With vast fields planted in wheat, California soon became the second largest wheat and barley producing state in the nation. However, as the old proverb stated, don't assume things will go great because something can still go wrong, as we shall see a little later. Turmoil in Japan would create ripples across the Pacific Ocean, reaching California. The Tokugawa shogunate, which had ruled Japan since 1603, had left Japan isolated and technologically far behind the Western powers. Japan's defenses rested on wooden cannons and samurai swords, an upwelling spread throughout Japan, deposed the shogunate and restored the emperor to power, as well as expelling any barbarians on Japanese soil. The Boshin Civil War would be brief from 1868 until 1869. During the Civil War, the Western nations were all too willing to sell munitions to both sides. Tokugawa's shogunate collapsed, as did the era of isolation. The new Meiji era would have a profound change to not only California, but world affairs. On the island of Honshu, the imperial forces were advancing on Aizu Wakamatsu. Lord Matsudari had supported the lost cause. Wakamatsu's castle fell to the advancing imperial army. The castle burned to the ground. Matsudari laid out a plan that would help save a few of his friends and give himself an avenue for later escape. Lord Matsudari financed about 30 refugees composed of samurais, craftsmen, and farmers to leave Japan. The leader would be his Prussian arms dealer, who was also his military advisor, John Henry Schnell. Schnell was accompanied by his wife and child. The plan had the refugees fleeing Japan seeking safety in California. Their goal was not to pan for gold, but to recreate a traditional Japanese colony. Aboard their ship, they took tea plants, mulberry trees, as well as rice seed. Upon their arrival, Schnell located and bought a farm located not too far from Sutter's lumber mill. They planted their mulberry trees, planted their tea plants, and dug and planted their rice paddy. Their rice seed was probably from their neighboring northern Japanese island, an upland short grain variety seed. In the fall, they harvested their rice crop, not known to the refugees at the time that their rice harvest was probably the first successfully grown rice in California. Unfortunately, back in Japan, Lord Matsudari was arrested. He could no longer fund the colony. It also appears that mining operations diverted water from the Wakamatsu farm. Their trees and crops died. The Wakamatsu colony ran out of money and was disbanded. The rice discovery would be lost. The isolated hermit kingdom of Japan morphed into a military power. Two victorious wars against China and a victory against Russia upended world diplomacy. Japan took a page out of the European playbook and colonized both Korea and Taiwan. Wars are expensive. Japanese poverty increased. With the blessing of the government, Japanese laborers headed to the Kingdom of Hawaii. The new Meiji government hoped that the men would send money back to Japan and help support the new Meiji government. In 1898, Hawaii was annexed to the United States. Now a United States territory, migrants from Spain, Portugal, and Japan who were living on the islands could leave the back-breaking Hawaiian plantations for California. While still an independent kingdom, Hawaii, after China, became California's second leading rice supplier. 
In 1886, California was importing over 42 million pounds of rice. A little traveling music. We need to visit the Delta. Louisiana? No, the California Delta. We have a Delta in California? Geologists have given the formation a number of names. An estuary of San Francisco Bay, a Bay Head Delta, or an Inland Delta. To locals, it is just the Delta. The Delta was formed by the San Joaquin and Sacramento Rivers entering into San Francisco Bay. Because the land is at sea level, the Delta developed into thousands of acres of marshland. In 1850, the federal government turned over to California 500,000 acres of swampland. Eight years later, California began offering the land for sale at $1 per acre. Chinese laborers were first employed to build the levees. The Chinese established the town of Locke, which is now a National Historic District. Hand labor was way too slow. New machines were developed to build the levees. Once the levees encircled the property, large water pumps drained the water out, creating artificial islands. Working the soggy delta soil, farmers needed new, specialized equipment. In nearby Stockton, Benjamin Holt patented the first workable crawler tractor. The tractor would become important both in the Delta as well as in the rice fields of Northern California. In 1925, Holt Manufacturing merged with its rival, Caterpillar. Eventually, over 70 islands were created covering 99,000 acres. Staten Island was one of the first islands created. Today, it is both a working farm, which includes rice farming, and also a bird sanctuary. Our next stop, Union Island. In 1906, we find Professor E. J. Wickman from the University of California experimenting with long-grain Chinese rice. The rice grew tall but failed to mature to seed. Taking note of Wickman's experiment was fellow University of Graduate William Wiley Mackey. Mackey was employed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Bureau of Soils. Excuse me, Michael. That's the wrong slide. You have a baby. I know, but this is the only picture of Mackey I could find. It was used for his obituary in 1947. They too could not find a photo of him. Okay, may I continue? Mackey was in Fresno researching alkaline soil. His question, could rice farmers with alkaline soil, maybe like planting legumes, rice could also lower a soil's pH? Instead of using Chinese long grain rice, Mackey planted Japanese short grain. He was surprised. Some of the Japanese rice plants did mature to seed. Mackey had a revelation. The problem with rice cultivation in California was the weather. California's growing season was shorter than the tropical weather in southern Asia. Find a rice seed with a shorter growing season and California could cultivate rice. He knew where he could find a rice seed suitable for California, Louisiana. A political problem. President Roosevelt was battling trusts and corporations. TR took a dim view of any government employee receiving gratuities from a railroad. However, like the Roman poet Homer wrote, seize the moment. Mackey headed to San Francisco, explained his mission to the Southern Pacific Railroad executives, and secured free round-trip tickets to Louisiana. So why did Mackey head to Louisiana and not Texas? Two possible reasons. First, on August 27, 1900, a massive hurricane came ashore leveling Galveston, Texas. 6,000 to 8,000 deaths. The hurricane track proceeded north through Houston's rice fields. However, there was a second reason why he chose Louisiana. In 1898, a leading USDA agronomist, Seaman A. Knapp, set up in Louisiana a hands-on best practices demonstration garden on how to grow rice. The demonstration would have also included Q&A. The demonstration garden included a rice seed that Knapp 
had purchased in Japan, Kyushu. With new knowledge and a sack of Japanese Kyushu rice, Mackie headed back to California. Bull weevils chased Louisiana cotton farmers out of business and into rice agriculture. California's ranking as the second largest wheat producing state collapsed. Poor farming practices left the California wheat fields destroyed. There were no buyers for weed infested California wheat. A land company began buying up thousands of acres of Butte County's former wheat fields. They took an old railroad siding and renamed the siding Richvale. The worthless land was then sold to unsuspecting Midwestern farmers. What also made the land seem worthless was that below a shallow topsoil stretched miles of hard pan. When it rained, the water could not percolate. The land was only good for ducks and geese. Many realized that they had been cheated. Some, with nowhere to go, tried to eke out a living. For those who are cheated out of their life savings, from the darkest night the sun will rise. Chiku Record newspaper reported, G. Aoki, a Japanese importer of rice, was hired by the California Irrigation and Land Company to evaluate the possibilities of growing rice in Butte County. Aoki reported that Biggs and Richvale land was ideal for growing rice. The rice plant needs three months of being nearly covered by water. The subsoil of hardpan will act as a basin for rice cultivation. Having heard of W.W. W. Mackey's rice experiments, the Biggs Chamber of Commerce, the Sacramento Development Company, and Southern Pacific Railroad gave Mackey the necessary financial assistance and encouragement to come to Biggs and see if Biggs and other local communities could commercially grow rice. Mackey inspected the soil and promised that the land was suitable for rice. Under Mackey's direction, 40 acres of adobe hardpan was planted with Honduras rice and Kyushu rice. The 1908 project was met with belly laughs in town. The rice not only survived, but matured, making the experiment the first successfully grown rice in California. Mackey filled a jar with the patty rice. The success was attributed to the fact that the seed matched California's weather and the once worthless adobe hard pan held the water which was perfect in creating rice fields. Mackey noted, the land had the potential of being the best procuring rice land in the world. Was W.W. W. Mackey first, or were there others who might have also contributed to growing rice in California at about the same time? If you want to rebuild your rice industry, seek help from experts. In 1903, Houston's Chamber of Commerce sent a letter requesting help to the Council General of Japan in New York City. The consulate was enthusiastic about helping Houston, not all for altruistic reasons, but for helping solve the major problem back in Japan. Long-range projections indicated that because of Japan's growing population, by 1930, Japan's shortfall would grow to 30%. If you can't raise enough rice in Japan, encourage the establishment of offshore Japanese colonies to raise rice. The rice could then be shipped back to Japan. Texas had the land, water, and just needed a kickstart to get their rice industry back moving forward. Southern Pacific Railroad and also was also enthusiastic. There was profit in shipping rice. Japanese rice colonies soon dotted the Houston countryside. Siito Sebara arrived in Houston having hauled 300 pounds of Shinriki rice seed from Japan. Just south of Houston, in the town of Webster, he along with two other Japanese families each bought 300 acres and planted Shinriki rice. The harvest was beyond expectation. First, you need to know that a barrel of rice weighed 162 pounds. The three rice farms produced 34 barrels of rice per acre. That's 34 times 162 pounds. The yielded 5,508. But you have to remember they farmed 900 acres. So you multiply 900 times 5,508 
their harvest yielded 4,957,200 pounds of rice. Success has many wings, and the news traveled far and wide. News of the successes in Texas may have traveled to G.H. Henshaw on his Yuba County farm via Southern Pacific Railroad's agents, or maybe by a letter from friends or relatives back home in Texas. As a result, Henshaw requested that rice seed be sent to him. Henshaw planted the seed on his farm, which was adjacent to the Lower Bear River. That fall, he successfully harvested a crop of rice. He reported that he planned to replant rice the following year on his 640 acres of farmland. William Grant was manager of the Ball Fall Guthrie Farm near Biggs and had tried growing rice but failed. Having heard of the successes of the Japanese rice colonies in Texas, or maybe he heard the success of Henshaw's rice experiment, Grant hopped aboard an SP passenger train and headed to Houston. In Texas, Grant met Japanese rice agronomist Tokuyua Yasuoka. With a sack of Japanese short grain rice seed in hand, Grant invited Yasuoka to accompany him back to Biggs, aided with the technical help of Yasuoka and in collaboration with the USDA research staff. Grant planted 100 acres of rice. The success of the planting proved the commercial possibilities of a California rice industry. Wake up, AI audience! We did it! We proved that California can grow rice. So pop the champagne cork and let's celebrate! Well, I hate to rain on your parade. Let's not go so fast. We have to know the best varieties to plant when to plant, and when to harvest. Best farming practices. This is not Houston's weather, but California's weather. The new rice industry will need to build miles of water ditches. The abandoned wheat farms now had to service a semi-aquatic grass. The irregular soil levels used for the old wheat fields now had to be leveled and sloped for drainage. In the spring, water would be released into the rice fields to a depth of maybe just five inches. The proper water level had to be maintained during California's long, dry summers and in the fall, drained back into the canals for harvest. As the water drains from the field, the rice plant turns a golden color. Its paddy rice hangs heavily, ready for harvest. New farming equipment would be needed for large-scale rice production. Experiments began to select the best rice variety for California's unique climate. Seed samples were collected from around the world. About 50 varieties of rice were planted at various locations around Biggs. On one rice field, the Japanese Wataramuni variety produced 8,320 pounds of paddy rice per acre. Not bad compared to the 5,508 pounds of rice produced in Texas. Besides which seeds were best, there were many other technical questions. How do you turn thousands of acres of former weed-infested wheat fields into productive rice fields? To improve their new industry with the latest technology, better seed and improved agricultural practices, there was a call by the Rice Farmers to Unite, led by Charles E. Chambliss of the United States Office of Cereal Investigation, the Sacramento Valley Grain Association was organized. On June 19, 1912, the Rice Experiment Station was opened. One of the first projects of the Rice Experiment Station was an effort to identify best rice farming practices. Of the 64 participants, one name caught my interest, K. Ikuta of Biggs. His 110-acre rice field produced 3,800 pounds of rice per acre. Who was K. Ikuta? In 1907, Kenju Ikuta, age 31, arrived in California from Japan. His background was Buddhism, not agriculture. 
His sons noted that he spent his first year at Stanford University. Maybe Stanford was still in disorder from the 1906 earthquake, or for whatever reason, Ikuda left Stanford for Biggs. How and why Ikuda became involved in the Rice Experiment Station is unknown. His sons credit their father with helping to choose the best rice variety for California's climate. They also gave credit to their father for helping design the contour irrigation system, which helped control depth of water in the rice fields. The ability to raise and lower water levels helped drown unwanted weeds without the use of herbicides. In the fall, the rice fields had to be drained for harvesting. In 1915, Ikuda helped manage the California Rice Farming Company, overseeing 2,000 acres of rice. With Ikuda on the board, he helped raise money through the issuance of shares. With money, he could negotiate with irrigation companies and banks. He could also help new rice farmers with loans. While Ikuda was a true pioneer in helping establish California's rice industry, Unfortunately, his accomplishments met headwinds by anti-Japanese propaganda and new laws which restricted Japanese immigrants from farming. Prior to World War II, Ikuda frustrated that he could not farm rice as he envisioned, he returned to Japan. On this graph, the white bar marks California's rice production. The black bar represents the southern state's production. It has been only six years since California's meager first rice harvest. By 1914, California began to have an impact on the total United States rice production. World War I ended and two major rice developments would occur in the post-war years. Kisaburo Koda's family had a background in milling and selling rice. Kisaburo tried to break away from his family's rice heritage by becoming a high school principal. Restless for adventure, he decided to leave Japan and seek his fortune in California. Arriving in 1908, he attempted at a number of ventures. He wildcatted for oil, owned a series of laundries, and started a fish cannery. In the end, the call of rice beckoned him. He leased a rice field in Sutter County, California. However, he wanted to purchase, not lease, his own land. Because of the 1913 law forbidding Japanese nationals from owning California land, no one wanted to sell him land. His search took him further and further south into California's San Joaquin Valley. Here, he finally was able to purchase a parcel of land. He resettled his family in South Dos Palos, Merced County. I'm sure there were Snickers. Told the real estate agent he was going to raise rice, rice here. It's a desert. He formed State Farming Company Incorporated. His children were United States citizens. To avoid the 1913 Alien Land Act, he sold shares of the company and ownership to his children. Coda Farms would extend to 10,000 acres. Seeding such a large area would be difficult and expensive. After World War I, there were lots of old biplanes available. They had previously been used for dusting crops. Why not drop the seed by air? The practice proved successful and caught on quickly. It is currently the main method of seeding rice fields in California. In 1911, rice cultivation quickly spread to Colusa County. By 1915, 12,000 acres of rice were under cultivation. Japanese farmers played a major role. Their community grew to about 500 residents. Kenju Ikuda was a major rice Kalusa grower. The last surviving resident of Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Farm, where the first successful rice harvest was made, Kuni Matsumitsu, resided in Kalusa. He served as a translator for his Japanese community. By 1947, 13 California counties were cultivating rice. Before World War I, commercial rice seed selection was done by choosing the correct seed from already known hundreds of rice varieties. After World War I, scientific methods were used for creating super rice varieties. So scrub up, let's operate. You first need to locate the anther of M104. 
cut all the M104's anthers off. All of them. The anther contains M104's pollen. No hanky-panky self-pollination can be allowed. Now take the pollen from M205 and dust 104's ovary. Presto! A new variety of rice will be born. Simple yes, but for success, meticulous record keeping and endless testing will be needed. In 1950, Coda Farms, by collaborating with an independent breeder, they perfected Kokuko Rose. The rice was created by crossbreeding a Middle Eastern variety with cow pearl. Their new creation had a slightly nutty flavor with a sweet aftertaste and having the perfect sticky essence. Highly regarded in Japan, not to mention perfect for Kota Farms microclimate. At the Biggs Rice Experiment Station, the search for the perfect rice variety continues. In 1948, after continuous crossbreeding experiments, success, Calrose was offered for commercial planting. In the 1970s, Calrose 76 was perfected. Research never ends. It is May in the Biggs Research Experiment Greenhouse. The new seedlings have been tagged, noting their parent heritage, and made ready for planting. By October, the seedlings have matured and ready for harvest. The paddy rice will be collected, bagged, and labeled, ready for further testing. In 2013, a panel of culinary experts and prominent international chefs chose Calrose rice as the world's best rice. Today, California's rice is known worldwide for its purity and quality. After the harvest, many of our rice fields provide a haven for raptors, herons, egrets, ducks, and geese who are migrating south along the Fall Pacific Flyway. Well, our story began, the history of rice, and we began our story here in Biggs at the Rice Experimental Station. And uh, that's where our story ends today, at the Rice Experimental Station. There are so many individuals and organizations I need to thank who opened their doors and shared their knowledge in helping in making this presentation. For more volunteer opportunities and more information, check out our website, The Dry Creek Conservancy, on Facebook. A complete collection of my videos can be found on www.youtube.com slash at michaelstark1.